Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second program for 2014 on composting basics from small to large operations. Uh, I'm glad, I'm very happy to have here with me Molly Harris from County, uh, Brazos County. Uh, she's a Brazos County Master Gardener and she took the compost specialist course in San Antonio uh, with uh, David Rodriguez. I've been teaching ever since. Um, and she's been teaching it ever since. So we will have a three section. Uh, we'll start with the composting basics which is applicable by everyone uh, from the uh, composting pail if you want to do a kitchen counter composting to a million dollar operation. The basics are the same. We will start with that. Uh, we'll have a break and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what the small acreage uh, commercial uh, growers do and uh, we will finish with uh, what the large scale operation New Earth in San Antonio, in San Antonio uh, what that large operation, what they do. Uh, I'll pass the keyboard and mouse to Molly and she will get started. Uh, hello, I, as um, Joe said, my name is Molly Harris. I am a Brazos County Master Gardener and I did take the compost specialist course which basically made me an evangelist. So let's get on with the program. Uh, as Joe said, composting basics applies to the home gardener, the, the acreage vegetable grower, as well as to the large commercial compost facility operations. And no matter what amount of compost is generated, the principles required to ensure the quality of the composting process remain the same. Only the size of the compost pile and the equipment needed to process it are different. So, as Joe also said, we're going to be talking about the small scale, which is the home gardener, which would be a single to many beds, the medium scale, which is a small acreage grower, and the large scale, which is a compost, commercial compost facility. So, the first one is going to, I'm going to be talking about is the home gardener and the basics of composting. So, why do you compost? Humus, which is the end product, is a sticky, holds the soil particles together and retains moisture. It improves the soil texture and structure by creating pore spaces in soil to permit air water circulation to the roots. If you're stuck with clay soils like we, we are here in Brazos County, it improves the drainage by creating little um, open spaces that, the, that the, the nutrients in the water can get to, through the soil. And in sandy soils, it uh, with, improves the holding capacity. Because it does that, it re reduces erosion because the organic matter holds the soil together, but not plastered like clay does. Natural compost, of course, is, is uh, found in, in the forest. Nature recycles the leaves and plants, forming a mulch that protects the soil. And over time, they decompose into nutrients that feed the forest plants. In the home garden, compost re reduces the need of commercial fertilizer because the organic matter holds the macro and micronutrients together. Because of that, it reduces the washing out of so soluble commercial fertilizers, which of course reduces the groundwater pollution. And it's available to the plants as needed and it lowers the soil pH in the root zone. Now, the soil pH, of course, re refers to potential hydrogen, and that is the way that the plant absorbs the nutrients. And 7 is neutral. 5 to 7 is safe. 5 to 8 is actually safe. But, of course, if you're in Brazos County, it's 8.4. And that is unacceptable, because the plants just cannot absorb the nutrients as well as they should. Effect on the landfills with compost. It reduces the amount of organic food waste, which produces methane and toxic leachate gases. If you go by any commercial landfill and you see a long um, pipe that's got fire coming out of it, that is methane gas being, being burned because, of course, it's highly flammable. 
Over 30 million pounds of organic waste is generated each year, but only 3% is recycled. Now pay attention to the next two carefully. 30% of the landfill is yard waste, which is grass, plant debris, and all that stuff. Up to 50% is organic food waste. That means 80% of our landfills could have been composted. Home compost versus commercial fer fertilizer. Commercial products only work for a short time. Compost continues to make nutrients available as the plant needs them. By supplying a great variety of ingredients, you provide a higher nutrition content. And the nutrients from vegetable and yard trimmings are in perfect proportion to, the benefit, to benefit the plants. OK, so a lot of the times when I talk, it's coming from personal experience. I got into recycling, and com well, composting is, of course, a portion of recycling by necessity. We, belong, we are outside the city limits. And the rural garbage quarterly rate went up to $12 for a single weekly pickup. That comes out to $624 a year. In 2009, I took a course um, sponsored by the Brazos Valley Solid Waste Management Agency on composting. And I learned the, com the composting techniques and what I could recycle. OK, from, from that, I now recycle aluminum cans because you get cash back for them. We have a local a recycling company uh, in Bryan that the last time that we keep um, our aluminum cans in 55-gallon plastic bags and save them up till we get about four of them and then take them to the recycling center. And the last time I did that, I came home with $31 in my pocket. I also recycle number one and two plastic. I wish I did more, but that's where we are right now. And I also compost all kitchen, vegetable, and fruit scraps and yard waste. That decreased our weekly garbage rate from five 55-gallon bags to one. It seemed kind of silly you know, to have the, um, the garbage pick up for only one measly bag. So now we take a trip to the landfill once every six weeks. Remember, I've taken out all the stuff that could be composted, which means we make eight trips a year an average $2. Actually, we, act, we, we put in a whole bunch of stuff this last time, came out $2.12. So if you average that out for the year, $16, which certainly beats $624. I also found out that uh, this is from the city of Wichita Falls, which, as you may know, is in stage five uh, drought right now. One cubic yard of compost equals $207 worth of chemical fertilizer, $205 worth of humic acid, which is this, um, nature's soil additive, $150 of dry molasses, which is also a natural fertilizer. One cubic yard will save you $562. So now that I've convinced you that you really do need to compost, this is how you determine how much you're going to need. And remember, we're talking about the home gardener right now. Each, you, you take each one of your beds, and you measure it, the length of them in feet, by the width in feet, by the depth in inches, and you divide by 324, which gives you cubic yards. Well, why do that? Well, commercial compost bags are sold in cubic yards. And this will tell you, you know, how much you need. The other thing you need to determine is what kind of plants are in your beds. Are they vegetables, flowers, shrubs? And I'm going to tell you later why that's important. Then you need to have the, the bins in a handy location to your bins, your beds. You want to get plenty of sun, some shade, access to rain and water, and protect it from the wind. Now you've got several options. No bed at all. And just to add a pile in your yard. There's no cost, obviously. The drawback is, of course, it takes at least a year or more to generate compost. And I personally, I have a certified wildlife habitat. And if I had a big pile out there in my backyard with my kitchen scraps, I would, I would attract all kinds of people, like raccoons, possums, all kinds of other creatures. So. There's all kinds of designs of bins. So for the small garden or a few bins, one or two bins are adequate. 
For a larger garden or several bins, then three bins are recommended. One for storing new material, one for cooking material, and one for storing finished compost. Now there's all kinds of measurements out there. The one that, see, that, that um, comes up with exactly one cubic yard is three feet high by three feet long by three feet wide for easy management. Larger piles really get difficult to turn. And there's all kinds of bin designs, and here are just a few of them. The Brazos County Master Gardener Demonstration Idea Garden, which is also called the DIG, currently shows the following, uses the following bins or displays them. The first one, the first one is called the concrete bin. The second one is the barrel. The next one is the circular bin, which as you can tell is stuck underneath the barrel because it's of no use whatsoever. And this one, this is the rubber bin. And as we uh, found out that that was really good for storage. Now you see this, this uh, board that's right up here at the top. I'm, you see nothing but yellow now. Right there is um, a screen that one of the master gardeners built for us because our compost supplies uh, material for the entire garden, vegetables, roses, everything. So we need a continuous quantity. And this is a real fast way to sift it. These are more bin examples. Right here you will see a wooden, a wooden wire bin. And right here, this is what's called a shepherd bin, and we'll be discussing all of these. Now, the, the, I'll, I'm going to go through each one of these bins one at a time, tell you the positives and negatives, and if, when you see one that says C handout, that's going to be in the specs that Joe, that Joe sent you. So positive with the concrete blocks, supposedly they're easy to move, but, but you know, I'm kind of short, and they're, they're you know, really not that easy to move. But you can make as many bins, bins out of them as you want to. The drawback is it doesn't hold much, as you saw in that previous slide. This is a single bin, the barrel bin, and this is a really tiny one. Uh, this can be built or purchased. It's used for small gardens, you know, great for patio homes, that kind of thing. The biggest drawback to it is it's got this tiny little opening, which is going to make it really hard to get your compost out, even if you know, this thing does rotate, but, you know, how do you get to the, to the compost so that's either, either end of it? This is the circle bin. This is the one that was stuck underneath the barrel bin uh, in, the, in the, the, the dig garden. It's, it's, it's cheap. It's made of poultry wire that comes in three foot high by 25 feet long rolls. You cut off 11 feet of the wire to make a three foot cylinder. It looks easy, of course, but it's very flimsy. It's not durable and it's impossible to turn the material. This is the pallet bin. The pallets are often free from businesses. You nail four pallets together to make a four-sided bin. A fifth pallet can be added to make a cover. It's sure easy to move. And you can see again the specs are in the handout. The drawback is because it's really cheesy wood, it's not very durable. This is called the Lehigh bin. It's easy to build. It's adjustable in size. It's portable. It's durable. Provides good insulation, as you can see those open slats. But the drawback is there's no easy gate for compost re uh, removal. You're going to have to stick your, your, um, your fork or your shovel you know, into the middle. And there's no cover protection from critters. This is the wood wire bin, the single bin. You, can, you saw at the, um, uh, at, the, at the dig garden, one that was you know, way back there behind the, the butterfly garden. I did so much complaining about this particular bin that they finally took it out. Because the problem is, the problem is, you know, it's got this open door here, which is great for getting the stuff, um, you know, for getting the compost out. But when you go to shut the door, there's always something gets, that gets stuck in there, and you can't shut it. The other problem was that since I'm vertically challenged, and I didn't realize that you could open the door, I used to stand on top of a concrete block to try to turn. And that was sort of, you know, hard. So this is the, the wooden wire three bin system. This is best for generating steady amounts of compost in, um, in, in a large garden area. It's durable. Obviously, it's not portable. And you can also add a cover protection. And again, the specs are in the handout. Now. 
when my husband and I built a log house, and we had a bunch of leftover cedar from the cedar side, from some of the cedar siding, and he got, you know, agreed that he was going to build me some bins. The only problem is that whenever my husband builds something, it's a piece of furniture. So, as you can see right off, it's got a whole bunch of wood. It's also under an overhanging roof, which limited the sun and the rain. You see the shade on it right there? It's got way too much wood. There's not enough screen for, um, as you can, of course you see the wood right there. There's not enough screen. There's this little screen there, the little screen on top, on the top up here, and the one on the doors. That's it. So you didn't get enough air circulation. Also, the, the middle part right in here was solid wood. It wasn't screen. So there was hardly any air circulation. And to top it all off, the bins, the handles, are all on the same side. Now, I was blessed with a, uh, a top loader washer and dryer that were arranged the same way. The handles were on the same side. What does that mean? That means if you open the door, you get a scoop of compost, you back up, you, but you take one step to the right, you, and then throw it in the other side. Not real good. Plus, as you can see, the doors don't reach the ground, which means you get down to that bottom level of compost, and you've got to dig it out from the corners, and it's just a pain in the neck. So after griping, okay, this is an example of a good three bin. When I took the course at the, at the you know, San Antonio Botan uh, Botanical Garden, uh, this is the bins that they use for the Botanical Garden. You can see it's a very simple design. You've got, they use a um, three-gauge wire screen, and that's on the sides, the back. They don't have a cover on theirs, but you can certainly add it. And it's got, the other thing I like was it's got removable front slats, which allows easy access. You get all the way down to the bottom. Now, as I said before, I, I griped and griped about my bins. So finally, my husband said, OK. Give me some specs, and I'll build it. So now it's close to my garden and a water supply. As you can see, this is, um, I think he said, this is, well, there we go. This is hardware cloth. And, but he did just insist on putting pavers on the ground. You don't have to, but he did. It's got, you know, this is it's a three-bend design. It's got the slats that I wanted. It also has a cover to keep the critters out and lots and lots and lots of wire. Now, this is what's called the shepherd bin. Somehow, when I first learned about it, I thought it was some kind of biblical reference. But anyway, what's positive about it, it's durable. It's easily moved. All you do is just, well, a lot of times it takes two people to lift it up and then just move it you know, over. It's got a central tower for added ventilation. You can get them with the cover, which is right here. And it's available from the CE Shepherd Company in Houston. The information about it is also in your handout. The drawback is it can be very expensive. If you pick it up, and, and as far as I know, the price is still $49.95, including tax, if you pick it up with the company. But a UPS shipment to College to Bryan College Station will cost you approximately $100. So what a bunch of master gardeners did was just go down there in a group and buy the bins and then just bring them back. Now the equipment needed. OK, this is my compost pail. So you can see it has that. It has holes in the top of the lid, and it also has filters. It's got two filters in there, which keeps um, any kind of odor, odors down. I started out with a waste basket from Walmart, but I found out that I didn't realize, I didn't know about the composting process, that decomposition starts immediately. You know, the, the, those, um, the vegetables that are sitting around your refrigerator too long, well, they're starting to decompose, right? And so I put it in this little waste basket, but it didn't have openings at the top. 
which meant that I had all of this liquid, gassy stuff uh, on the top, and all and the, the hinges and stuff rusted. So that's when um, I got smart and got myself the compost pail. Anyway, your, whatever pail you decide to get should be about one to three gallons to collect vegetable and fruit scraps, and you should have the holes in the top. And great, grocery bags are a great liner. Uh, I did find out, I tried all kinds of grocery stores around here, like HEB and Walmart and all that. The Walmart liner, liners are way too big. They're too long. So you have to experiment with that. But you put the liner in there so that you can, you know, just take it to your, um, well, it just keeps it a lot more tidy, and you can take it straight to your compost pile. And you empty, but when I say empty when full, um, don't do it like I do. You know, sometimes you get lazy and you 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 um, don't take the thing out and you lift the bag out. And you notice there's all kinds of liquid at the bottom of it. That means that the decomposition is already underway and you wasted it. Now the next thing I want to, I actually want to show you is the spade fork. This is not to be confused with a pitchfork. A pitchfork has long, skinny tines on it. A turning fork has much thicker tines, and it's also shorter. And that's much easier for you to be able to turn the material in your bin. You'll also need some loppers, which is down here. This is to cut large pieces into six to eight inch strips. One of the secrets of composting is the smaller the piece, the faster it's going to break down. The bigger the piece, the longer it's going to take. And there's the picture, of course, of my um, my turning fork. You need a pair of garden, some garden shears to chop up the small plant debris. You need a soil thermometer. Now, you can go to um, you know local producers co-op or whatever and buy yourself an ex expensive forty-five dollar soil thermometer, or you can use this is what's this is what's called a candy thermometer, and what you need is a is the, the end should be at least a foot long because it needs to get into your um, into your pile, and it has to have a minimum of. Can we show this? It has to have a minimum of 165 degrees. To record, you know, because, uh, to record your temperature, so a canning thermometer will do the job. Or you can pay the forty-five dollars for an official soil thermometer. I also forgot to tell you that the compost pail that I had runs about twenty-five dollars, and um, they're fairly common to find. You'll also need a garden hose with a nozzle on it to add your water, and you'll need a bucket or wheelbarrow to transport your compost. Now, remember when my when my husband built my uh, my new bins, and they were the same the same you know three by three by three. He took this is uh, he took the the top door, and that's what's now my screen, and it just fits the top of my wheelbarrow, and this is used to sift the compost. Now, compostable materials. You're going to need nitrogen, and you're going to need carbon. Nitrogen comes from anything that's green and fresh, and that includes grass clippings, plant and brush debris, uncooked vegetables. Now, if you want to, if you cook some vegetables, you've got some left over. Obviously, you don't want to put that in your tr your trash bag. But what you can, the difference is, if it's cooked vegetable, then most of the nutrients are gone. If it's uncooked like you know, ends of carrots or whatever, then that is going to supply more nutrition. Fruit scraps, great. Chopped human or animal hair. However, ladies, if you color your hair or get permanents, no, because you don't want to add extra chemicals into your compost pile. Blood meal. Poultry, rabbit, sheep manure. Notice I do not say horse or cow, which has always been sacred. I'm going to tell you why you don't in just a minute tea bags or tea leaves. And if you're running short on nitrogen, one of the really great sources is going to be coffee grounds. And you can throw the, the filters in there with them. 
This is the brown, the carbon, the dry. Notice we've got grass clippings again. So when the grass clippings are green, they provide nitrogen. When they're brown, they provide carbon. Old sod, mulch leaves. You notice I say mulch leaves. The oak leaves here take forever to break down. So you want to run, you know, mulching mower through them, get them into smaller pieces. Corn cobs and peanut hulls. Now I got an issue with peanut hulls because in my compost pile anyway, they took forever. And so I don't bother with them now. Wood shaving, sawdust. Newspaper or cardboard, but cut them into strips. Remember, the bigger the piece, the slower it's going to take to break down. Shredded paper. However, now any kind of paper is great. Paper towels, marvelous. But the problem with what I found with shredded paper is I think it depends on the particular um, printer paper that you get, the company, which I haven't tracked down yet. Because some of it breaks down, no problem, and some of it just stays in their little strips. I've actually have sifted my compost and found shredded paper that you could actually read part of a word on it. So I'm not quite sure what the issue is there. Additional nutrients that you can supply. If you throw in banana peels, orange peels, you're giving your compost potassium. If you throw in bone meal, you're giving it phosphorus. If you put in crushed eggshells, you give it calcium. Notice again I say crushed, because if you just throw in a half an eggshell, several months later you're going to still have a half an eggshell, so you want to crush it. I also found a trick for doing that. If eggshells, when you, when you first uh, get them, you know, have that slimy albumin stuff on the inside, which gets all over your fingers and all that, I used to just put a paper towel around them and, you know, crush them up that way. But now I find that if I leave them out for a few hours, that that albumin dries, the shell gets brittle, and they just shatter. Do not add, and I love this picture, horse or cow manure unless you know where the hay came from. A few years back, uh, hay producers started putting an herbicide down called Grazon. And because, of course, you know, it kept, it kept the, the pests and all that away. The problem with it is that it will, that no matter how hot your compost gets, the grazon does not break down. And it stays in your soil, I have been told, three to seven years. I uh, worked with a guy who had the personal experience of that. He had a large vegetable garden. His wife had horses. He'd always has, had used, of course, you know, the stuff from the stalls. And he put, he planted a whole big patch of uh, tomato plants and, you know, took, took, put down the compost as usual and all the, the tomato plants promptly died. Got a little suspicious about that, took the soil sample in and, of course, the gray sun was present. So just unless you know where that hay came from, just don't do it anymore. Dog or cat feces, obviously because of parasites and other diseases it can take. Animal products would include dairy, you know, milk or whatever, egg, egg yolks or whites, meat scraps, fat, because you've got the smell, which of course attracts critters. You also have, um, if you've got diseased plants or plants with seeds or questionable weeds, just don't. You know, you can throw those out. If you have any doubt whatsoever about putting something into your compost pile, chances are you better not do it. Oh, okay, I see, I see the question there. It's a 2,4-D. Uh, I know it's in the Perculam family. Grazon, there's two kinds of Grazon. There's Grazon Next and Grazon uh, P and D. Uh, the Grazon P and D is 2,4-D. 2,4-D is not the issue. Uh, that doesn't last uh, years. It's the picloram, it's the aminopyrrolid herbicides that last for years. Uh, and uh, this time of year, you may get a lot of uh, damaged tomatoes that look like 2,4-D damage, but it's really 
uh, residue of that herbicide, the aminopyrrolid or the picloram, in the, in the compost. I was sent a picture and the master gardener got upset that I told them it's in the compost because I saw the picture he sold me. He showed, sent me, had a lot of compost and he said, I didn't use compost this year. I found out that he used that compost three years ago in his mm. garden. And uh, I told him that's where it came from, from that compost that he got from uh, the manure stall from somewhere that sat outside a year or two that came from a field that must have been sprayed with grazon. So a year plus two and then plus three in his garden and it still showed uh, when he finally used it in his, uh, you know, planted uh, sensitive crops like tomatoes. So if in doubt, uh, and it's your duty to ask, the label clearly says uh, they're not they don't have to tell you uh, the where that compost came from, for what hay material came from. It's your duty as a buyer to check, and if in doubt, uh, do not use it. Okay. Well, as I said, um, there have been several uh, people that have said, "Well, if your compost gets hot enough, then that's going to kill seeds and all that kind of stuff." Well, the problem is, how do you know that your compost is getting hot enough? You know. Um, over time because uh, I have a, a, another master gardener who, um, you know, composted his uh, his beds and didn't realize he had a bunch of cantaloupe seeds that germinate, you know, grew, of course, inside the compost and they sprouted up all over the place in his flower bed. So, but anyway, never, ever, ever put in Bermuda grass, especially common Bermuda grass, and nutsatch. You are really asking for trouble if you do. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about the carbon-nitrogen ratio. And the optimum decomposition occurs when the starting mixture, when you're first making your, your compost pile, is uh, 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. And in selecting the compost material, the ones that are high in nitrogen, low in carbon, would be alfalfa hay. And you can see the, the, uh, um, the ratios there next to it. Grass clippings, that's going to be, remember, fresh grass clippings. Rotted manure, good kind. Oak leaves and vegetables. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, okay, the question is, can you discuss more of the sifting of compost? And we're going to write, get that, um, talk about that in just a minute. Um, vegetables, then you've got the high carbon to low nitrogen would be um, leaves. This would be the brown leaves. Corn stalks, straw, pine needles, sawdust. Things that are low, um, high nitrogen, low carbon, that's going to be mostly like type grass. Initially, now these are going to be the extremes. You want to actually, you want to make sure that you've got a, a balanced ratio between the carbon and the nitrogen. So if you're on the extreme of really high nitrogen, initially that's going to um, the, the organism populations are going to skyrocket. You're going to get a fast temperature increase, fast decomposition. But later on, the oxygen and the nitrogen are depleted. It's going to stink, and the temperature is also going to decrease. If you've got the high carbon to low nitrogen ratio, which is mostly straw or anything, you know, dried, the effects are going to be low temperature, slow organism population growth, slow decomposition, and the material looks the same after three weeks. Requirements for composting. Okay, you've got, you need your com compostable materials, the oxygen, and the water. Compostable materials, you're going to start out with green and brown, the ratio of one-third green, two-thirds brown, thin layer of soil once in a while. The nitrogen is going to supply the protein, the carbon, the food, and the energy. Oxygen will break down materials faster. Turn the pile regularly, let's see, every, every you know, couple of weeks. And if you can't do it that often, then you want to provide an extra oxygen source. Like a, uh, I know that, that some of the big box stores like Lowe's have rubber pipes that have holes in them. You cut them to that uh, three, three foot length or a little bit less. Put them in the center of your pile to give you extra oxygen. Now, with water, 
The pioches say the consistency of a damp sponge. It's neither soggy nor dry. And go into a little bit of detail about the microorganisms in the compost. First of all, there's a really great book. And being a, uh, an ex-research librarian, I've got it cited at the end of this presentation. And it's called Teeming with Microbes. And it has some outstanding color photos of what the bacteria and the fungi look as they're working inside your compost pile. Fascinating. Anyway, there's two types of, of bacteria, aerobic and anaerobic. The aerobic lives in oxygen. That's what creates the heat in the compost pile. At the beginning, they're called mesophilic. They do a medium temperature. And the thermophilic is what creates the high temperature. What you're looking for is what they call actinomycetes, which is a higher form of the mesophilic. And that's what liberates the carbon and the nitrogen and the ammonia to make nutrigen, nutrients available for the plants. Anaerobic live in ab absence of oxygen. It creates a foul odor when nitrogen is released as ammonia. Um, picture that as that's what um, is in, in uh, common urine, and that's about the smell you get. Anaerobic. Organisms utilize less than 5% of the oxygen. This occurs in nature in the marshes and the mudflats. Produces a methane gas and, of course, stinks. Aerobic is 90% faster than anaerobic. Organisms require more than 5% oxygen. Occurs in nature when you've got the leaf litter on the forest floor. And it takes aeration, moisture, the organic materials, and temperature. Fungi, and you see this is kind of short. This is what happens at the end. This is also when you get into composting and you look at some of the material that looks like it's kind of like little white specks, that's the fungi. And these, this is what obtains um, energy by breaking down the organic matter in plants and animals, and it takes over in the final stages of decomposition. Macroorganisms, this is what you see without the microscope right there in your compost pile. Mites, millipedes, centipedes, earwigs. It, what earwigs are, I finally determined, they're, they're kind of long, skinny, shiny black. Got spiders, springtails, beetle, beetles, nematodes, good nematodes, and earthworms. We got the call at the extension office of Lady Frantic. She said, I've got earthworms in my compost pile. What do I do? And we all said, rejoice. Matter of fact, the last time I sifted my compost, I had five earthworms in it. I was just, oh, wow. Anyway, these further break down the plant material and eat other microorganisms in your pile. Now, when this stuff gets into the soil, it unlocks the nitrogen, the phosphorus, potassium, and other nutrients the plants need. They consume plant exudates and then are eaten by bigger microbes. And there's two types of soil. If you've got vegetables, annuals, or grasses, then you want a soil that's bacterial leaning. That means more on the nitrogen side. If you've got perennials, trees, and shrubs, you want your soil to lean more to the fungal side, which is carbon. Now, building the pile. This is also we're going to talk about sifting. If you're building on bare ground, it's really safer if you spread out some, ser some several layers of newspaper sheets to block out weeds and grass. You can also use maybe three or four inches of uh, mulch if you prefer to do it that way. You want to add three to six, and these don't have to be, when I say inches, these, this is estimate, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to take a ruler or just make sure it's absolutely perfect. Um, add three to six inches of chopped branches or brush to allow air circulation at the base of the pile. And this can also be longer than that six to eight you know, inches we talked about before. It's merely to perform, to have some air down there in the bottom. Then you want to kind of make a sandwich. You see right, right here, you've got this is going to be the brown, and this is the green, and so forth. Six inches of chopped green, or if you want to go brown first, fine. You want to add six inches of chopped green, six inches of chopped brown, 
make a sandwich of the alternating layers and thoroughly water each layer and repeat until the pile fills the bin, if you can get it to the top of the bin. The reason for that is, is that that three-foot volume is going to create um, more compost for you. Anyway, the reason why, the primary reason why you're doing this, obviously when you turn the pile, all that stuff is going to get mixed together. Fine. All it is is just a reminder for you that you need both green and brown. Maintaining the pile. This is when, you know, when, when you, your compost bucket gets full. You want to add material to a hole dug in the center. Now, some people do it on the sides. I don't know. But the most heat is generated in the middle of the pile. Add water if the pile is dry, especially if, you know, if the leaves are dry. Turn the pile so new material is thoroughly covered and dampened. You know, dig a hole, bury it. And you're going to expect that pile volume in, in the first week or two to shrink by at least a third. Every few weeks, you want to turn the pile by moving what's in the center to the sides and what's in the sides to the center. Or, of course, to be a lot simpler, you have two bins and you take the stuff from bin one, you throw it in bin two. You want to check the temperature. And when the temperature stays low, the pile is done. Water as you go to ensure uniform dampness. Increased turnings will make the pile more bacterial. That means if you want vegetables. If materials are not decomposing, they're too big. Cut them into smaller pieces. You want to use a long stem thermometer to periodically check the pile's temperature. Or when you've been doing this a long time, you can actually put your hand in there and you'll feel the heat. A properly cooked pile will reach 155, 160. You need the high temperature to kill pathogens, weed, weed seeds, and pest control. Unfinished compost. Now, here's where we're going to get into sifting. You can still recognize chunks of leaves, little pieces of eggshell, coffee filters, sticks. This is one of the things I learned the hard way. When I was first starting out composting and I had some new plants, I decided, well, hey, it's done enough. So I, when I dug my hole for my plant, I, I put some of that unfinished compost, you know, tucked it in there around the plant. And I noticed that, and I, I did this with several plants, and as I described it to a friend of mine, I said, if my plants were children, and of course to me they are, um, I would say it was suffering from failure to thrive. Well, it was, because what was happening is because that unfinished compost wasn't done yet. And it was taking nitrogen from the soil surrounding those roots to finish its process. So another lesson, lesson learned the hard way. You want to use a screen. And as I said, you know, that, that one uh, that three, three foot by three foot that I had neatly fits over the, to, you know, the top of my um, wheelbarrow. You want to use a screen to separate unfinished pieces from the finished. And the way I do it, I have a pair of old ancient gloves that I don't care about. And I use, if you ever saw the, uh, the movie Karate Kid, if you remember wax on, wax off with your hands, you're going this way. That's the way I do it. And you get it so that the finer particles are going to go down into the wheelbarrow. And whatever is left, you know, you don't throw it out. You put that in whatever pile you're working on that's still cooking. Finished compost. It's going to be dark green, kind of crumbly. It's going to have an earthy smell. However, I also want to caution you. Remember that one of the, one of the things in that compost is fungus. I, actually, I met a lady at the gym one day, and somehow we got on this, this discussion of composting. And she said she'd done it for about 20 years, but she, she gave it up. Because she used to put, she loved the smell, of the, that earthy smell of the compost, and she would put it right to her nose. And guess what? It went to her lungs, and she's got permanent bronchitis. So, you know. Anyway, your, uh, the compost pile will no longer heat up when it's turned or dampened, and you should also not recognize, you know, big eggshells, egg portions of leaves, and all that. And when it's finished, you want to let the pile sit a few days to stabilize. Now, uses 
for finished or sifted compost. Remember I said finished. You can use it as a long fertilizer, which means you aerate and fill the holes with the compost or work in two inches of compost directly into the lawn. To prepare a vegetable garden soil for planting, you want to till or spade about six inches of compost into the top eight or ten inches of soil. This will create a 12-inch root zone for the plants. Remember, you're reducing that pH. And you want to add compost to the soil each time you replant. Also, you can use the finished compost as part of uh, your potting soil for your household plants. <laughs> Too fast. Now, one thing I did want to tell you is mulch compared to compost. Mulch is used on top of the soil to protect the soil from weather extremes, heat, cold, and to suppress weeds. Mulches eventually will decompose into compost. And a trick that I um, discovered, I think gardening is, is probably you know, one experiment after the other. Um, now, instead of just dumping a new mulch right on top of the old one, I take the old mulch off and throw that into my compost pile because I, I see all that white stuff in there and I know that's fungus and uh, it you know gets things going in my in my pile. Now finished or sifted compost is worked into the soil to provide nutrients. You can use unfinished compost as a mulch spread at one inch to three inches around plants and trees and shrubs but don't put it directly next to stems or trunks because of course then it's going to start uh, robbing nitrogen from the soil right around it. Okay, being the librarian I am, I want to give you some resources. And I did check this URL, it works. This is on the Aggie Hort uh, website, and there, it's called Don't Bag It, Compost It, chapters 1 through 7, and there's the URL. And this is what you'll find there, the decomposition process, composting fundamentals, composting structures, building, maintaining, using it, and here are also a few books. The one I told you about before, Teaming with Microbes, excellent. The one that's considered to be the Bible of composting, even though it's been around since 1992, the Rodale Book of Composting, and if you're ever into soap operas, somebody sent me an article called As the Compost Turns. I love that. All right, welcome back, and there was a there was a question on Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass, uh, we were talking about it earlier uh, during the break. If you're sure you're mowing your lawn and you're getting only the leaves, I don't see that's a problem. But you can never be sure you're getting all the leaves. I can assure you that if you have one piece of rhizome or a small section of the stem, even if it's one inch long and it goes into your garden, that one section can become three feet in one season. So it's not instant death uh, in the sense of never ever use it, is maybe use it at your own risk. But any other perennial weed, uh, nut sedge, the nuts will survive uh, the composting and you don't want nut sedge or any other difficult perennial weeds uh, in, put it in the compost pile because you'll never be sure if they're uh, completely dead or not. Okay? And you don't want to take them back out to the garden. Source of thermometers. Um, kitchen store. Uh, candy ki thermometer. It's called a candy thermometer. It's uh, about a foot long in length uh, at any kitchen store. And let me show it to you again. Here is, it's a one foot long. Um, this one goes up to 500 because it's for cooking. But we put the dial at 160. Uh, this way it's easy to, to use in the garden to see exactly where the needle needs to be. Uh, so this is for cooking, but uh, it's a lot cheaper than buying um, uh, a salt thermometer. Of course, uh, the uh, salt thermometer can come in three feet length uh, used by commercial operations 
or a sensor attached to a digital di uh, dial, uh, you know, that I'll show you a picture of later. All right. So, sifting uh, is, uh, is 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 uh, important uh, because no matter what you do, you will never get 100% uniform composting uh, at once. Even commercial operations, they sift their material before they bag it. Because why wait for 100% of the material to be perfect when 95% or 90% is done? Let's uh, bag, uh, sift it, bag it, sell it, uh, and then recycle that last 5 to 10%, put it back in the compost pile. Um, uh, and uh, speed up the operation. You don't want to sacrifice 90% that can go bad, over decompose, over breakdown, if you think you like uh, that term, uh, for the sake of the last 5 to 10%. Okay? Okay, composting for the small acreage growers. So now we are talking to uh, uh, about uh, a small acreage operation, whether for sale or whether to generate enough material uh, for the one to five acre that you have. Then you can imagine you need uh, bigger equipment. All the principles uh, are the same. All the requirements are the same. It's just uh, you're talking about a little bit larger scale. And I love this uh, quote by Bill Adams. You know him. Most of you know Bill Adams. He's a retired county agent. The gardener with the most compost wins. Uh, take that to heart. And I agree with Molly when she said always add compost before, the, like the last thing you want to do before you plant. Add it, mix it in. Um, I know a gardener who has had his pH 6.8 for the last five years because he adds compost and the compost became a buffer and his pH is not uh, going anywhere, up or down. Okay, so when you're talking about a large uh, scale, then your kitchen or your home supply of compost material is not enough. So what are the sources, uh, sources for large amounts of uh, of uh, mulch or raw material, uh, community landfills. Many communities uh, sometimes they offer it for free if you just come and take it. Uh, and here is uh, an example of one uh, in uh, College Station. Uh, just come with the truck and they'll fill it for you for free. Take it. It's uh, chip woods, uh, I guess trees that fall down from storms or uh, uh, Yard clippings, they did shred it, and you're welcome to come uh, take it uh, uh, as much as you want. Uh, municipalities are doing the same. Here's a picture from Beaumont where you take a trailer uh, every Saturday, and you can uh, allow one. Um, I mean, it's an excellent source of uh, mulch uh, that this gentleman here is using uh, 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 as a source for his uh, compost material free of charge. Um, again, I love that uh, 5 by 5 by, uh, no, uh, three, by three. 3 by 3 by 3 is equal to 1 yard, and you can do the math and see exactly how much you need. In some locations uh, where uh, rice is common, uh, rice hulls, they, the companies, throw, uh, the milling company uh, throw it, and once in a while they burn it, so they will be very happy for you to come take all you want. In other places where cotton is uh, uh, grown uh, a lot, uh, the cotton mill also is, is available. Uh, although that's becoming very popular to use as compost or as feed uh, for animal that uh, may not be as avail as free as it used to be. But this in the Beaumont area, you can take all the rice hulls you want, uh, and I'll show you pictures of uh, um, a little bit more pictures. Uh, on what's done. Um, commercially, you can imagine that uh, uh, crop stubble, um, the uh, leftover of the crop is excellent source of uh, that material that is shredded. You know, they bush hog it, shred it to smaller pieces, let it rot, and incorporate it. It's not really composting, 
but it's uh, again recycling that organic matter back in the soil. If you want to do uh, like what's on the left side of the picture here, uh, cold crop family or the brassica family or the cruciferi family like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, if you decide to shred it, uh, chop it, shred it to fine pieces and incorporate it in the ground, be very careful. Uh, it can create a minute amount of mustard gas, not enough to bother you at all, but enough to uh, kill uh, any seed uh, that you plant in the garden. So and on the left side here, if you, let's say, you shred all this and put it in the garden, uh, you will not have any luck germinating any seeds, um, um, but uh, transplants uh, is not a problem. Okay, um, so of course, if it goes in the if it goes in the compost pile uh, in the right proportion uh, with the, uh, the brown matter, uh, by the time it uh, composts well and after all these weeks and turning and adding water, uh, that is not the mustard gas is not an issue anymore. Okay, so here is uh, a. Uh, a uh, what I call a mid-size or a large garden or a mid-size uh, composting operation using rice hulls. This is a five by five by five bin, just made with uh, chicken wire. Uh, no cattle panel wrapped with uh, tarps. Cattle panel wrapped with a tarp and T post to make a five by five by five, and the front opens. And uh, this gardener here adds layer of rice hulls, layers of plant debris, layer of rice hulls, layer of plant debris. And uh, right now his garden is 50 by 150 uh, foot uh, wide by 50 feet deep and uh, foot and a half inch deep of pure compost that he's generated. So if three by three by three is one yard, five by five by five is about four yards of garden and I'll show you some numbers later. And, uh, and, and this gentleman tells me that the rice hulls due to his nature, even if it's five foot deep, uh, it allows a lot of air to go all the way down uh, because it doesn't stick to itself, uh, that there's no need to turn at all. That's, so that's why you see here, this is closed, only open on the top. And he does, uh, he loves rice hulls. Of course, he's in the rice hull country um, uh, because he doesn't have to turn it. It's um, uh, here's the uh, thermometer and uh, 60 degree, 62 is about 130 uh, degree Fahrenheit. So it's slowly cooking, but uh, he said he never had to bother with turning it. So, uh, and he is uh, taking composting to a layer, uh, the next step where he's doing in-ground composting instead of bins. Um, in addition to the bins that you saw, these alleyways here, this alleyway here and here is uh, either partially composted rice hulls or the mulch he gets from the municipality. A year later, it's uh, get a lot of rainfall, get a lot of rain, it uh, compost, he digs it up, throws it on the bed and refills it with new material and that's what we call uh, in-ground composting. Um, and this picture here shows you that another way of uh, composting is called sheath composting. Let's say you have a crop, cucumber or anything uh, that you just finished harvesting. Um, you just uh, chop them and he uses, uh, what do you call that, tool or whatever, uh, tool doesn't come to mind, like a hoe to chop it to small pieces. And then, uh, so here's uh, step number one. This is how it was at the end of harvest. He uh, chopped it uh, with a blade uh, as fine as he can and then ran a uh, rototiller 
and uh, incorporated those pieces. And you wait a few weeks for all that to, to break down, and then it's ready to plant. Look at his carrots. That is the garden I told you about. That's a foot and a half of pure compost that he's generated uh, after five or six years of uh, combination of that bins, five by five by five bin, and combination of uh, uh, in-ground composting. In-ground composting, trench composting uh, is the same idea. This is uh, what he does. Uh, um, uh, this is the alleyway. He uses the uh, uh, fork uh, that Molly showed you to soften it before he digs it up from here. And uh, he also has a uh, what, is, what is that bird? Uh, rototiller. That's a small rototiller. Uh, uh, to also he uses some time to soften this uh, uh, quickly before he digs it up and uses it and it's pure compost. Here's another picture of uh, after he dug up the compost, uh, put it on top of the beds here and here and now he brought in the uh, raw material, uh, the mulch uh, shredded uh, bark, trees, leaves, uh, whatever, uh, and ready to come in here. So all he has to do is level that off and plant on uh, plant in it. Okay, uh, another way of composting on a large scale uh, is let nature do its work for you, uh, and that's what a lot of a small or large acreage operation is is you just plant a cover crop and then you uh, chop it and incorporate it in the ground and any of the bean family uh, is a wonderful uh, source because they fix nitrogen uh, so you go from this uh, of course this is fava bean that can be harvested and it's a wonderful uh, tasty bean uh, but he's only growing it here and it's not even ready to harvest but he chopped it incorporated it to go from this to this uh, and ready to plant uh, after after a while so uh, in a rotation uh, some uh, fields they grow alfalfa they grow Austrian winter pea over the winter and the first thing they do in the spring uh, in field preparation is they disc it and incorporate it and put back all that nitrogen that was fixed. So it's a form of composting without, uh, you know, need for sift and bag and sell and, and do all this. It's uh, another word for it, if you've heard of it, it's called green manure, where you're using the green matter as a source of manure for the following crop. Uh, fava beans or peanuts or uh, Austrian winter pea, clover, alfalfa, there's a whole slew of uh, plants suitable uh, for our area uh, that fix nitrogen, uh, don't, don't grow tall uh, and um, e can easily be chopped and incorporated and add food uh, for the following crop. Okay, remember if, if you want to be on the commercial scale and every pound of nitrogen is a lot of money, uh, when, you want, when you get a soil test and it tells you you need 80 pounds of N per acre, uh, commercially, you, uh, you want to think, uh, okay, how much organic matter I have in the soil? If I have 1% organic matter, you saved yourself 20 pounds of N immediately. Instead of applying 80, now you have to worry about adding 20. So uh, that's why uh, uh, on a small acreage or a large acreage scale, you want to let nature work for you and, and plant a cover crop and incorporate it to add that 1% or 2% extra organic matter initially and sometimes 10% organic matter initially that will disappear by the end of the season, but at least initially it's there and you save yourself a lot of uh, nitrogen. Uh, all the work, if you add up your cost, your time, your equipment, your fuel to plant and uh, that cover crop and disc it and incorporate it, it will be a lot cheaper than adding 200 pounds of N per acre or 80 pounds of N per acre. Okay? 
So here is uh, some numbers to show you. Uh, again, it may not work uh, with um, other types of compost that require turning. Uh, he found with the rice hulls that uh, there, there's no foul odor. Uh, uh, it's uh, composting evenly because uh, oxygen reaches all the way down uh, the f five feet depth. Um, but if you have to, uh, you can just cut the clips that are here, open it, and then turn it, or uh, of course this is 5 by 5 by 5, so maybe a small tractor with a front bucket to remove, dig it up from one and place it in the other next to it, and that movement alone is, uh, is, uh, uh, is the equivalent of turning it. But 5 by 5 by 5 is 4.6 cubic yards. So let's say you want to spread four inches uh, of compost. The 4.6 cubic yard can cover 375 square feet. So one of these uh, bins here, 375 square feet divided by 50 feet length, he can uh, cover a four inch uh, layer of compost uh, about seven and a half foot wide by 50 foot long, uh, which is the length of his garden. So you really, that's why uh, one or two that he has is not enough to cover the 100 foot wide garden. And that's why he, uh, in addition to these, he is using the in-ground composting uh, and uh, the green manure of uh, growing fava bean, peanuts, and incorporating it as a source of green manure green compost or green manure. And I'm going to show you a few slides if you are interested in doing this. Um, I'll show you a few slides how to build this quickly. And you'll see that uh, he's just using zip ties, to uh, simple zip ties uh, to uh, tie those uh, uh, panels together. It's easy assembly, uh, put, put, can be easily put together. Uh, so. Uh, Cattle panels cut to the appropriate uh, length, uh, tarp, uh, zip ties, and T-posts. That's all you need to build one like this. And this is uh, when you open the front door, uh, you'll see layer of rice hull, layer of plant matter, layer. So this is layer of plant matter, layer of rice hull, layer of plant matter, layer of rice hull, etc., etc., as you go. And the temperature uh, halfway through that is uh, 56, which is about 132. So the earlier slide that had 62, that is definitely 150, 160. I can't, I don't know the exact math in my head. If you're interested in how to do this one uh, or modify it to your liking, this is how it is. Um, uh, cattle panels. Um, three pieces, uh, uh, tight three pieces, not one long piece, three separate pieces because remember, so here's one piece, here's one piece, and here's one piece because remember it has to fold to make, uh, uh, sorry, these are the four pieces to make the four sides. So here's four pieces and they're tied together with zip ties. And then once you tie them together with zip ties, um, uh, then you just fold them. You just fold them one turn, two turns, three turns until you get this uh, final product. And why does he like to turn it multiple times? Because the outside layer after a year or two, uh, this outside layer after it trots from sun, uh, you know, UV light, he just cuts that off and there's a couple more layers uh, inside uh, to use instead of a single layer, and then every time he has to start the whole process and re rebuild it from scratch. So after it's wrapped and folded, you straighten it up, and you can easily store it if you don't want to use it. Uh, and I love this picture because to me, this is what good compost should look like. You should not be able to uh, recognize uh, uh, sources of material that came from it, like Molly said earlier. Is the tarp breathable? No, the tarp is not breathable. So, uh, like I said earlier, it may not uh, work for uh, that size. Five by five by five may not work for large 
uh, for other um, material, but his rice hull, he found that he does not have to turn it um, because uh, oxygen reaches all the way through. But if you design one like he does, even at this height and dimension, and you can open the front gate like this, and you have two next to each other, even though it's really large, and again, we're talking here uh, large scale, not the homeowner scale. So hopefully you have a front uh, end bucket on a tractor. Then you can imagine that it's easy to dig that up from here and dump it here. And that is instantly uh, turning uh, the whole pile. OK? So uh, I, if I had a tractor with a front end bucket, I will do something this big, easy. Uh, um, you know, it, yes, it doesn't breathe from the side, but you can put that chimney uh, in the center here if you like to add extra air inside and uh, turn it to, uh, with the large equipment. Um, and of course, fine tune the system to what works for you. There's really no one cookbook recipe uh, that will work for everyone. If you talk to many uh, compost operations, each one have their own secret uh, trick, uh, what they do, what they add, how often they keep it suitable for their raw material, suitable for their location. OK. so. I love this picture. This is nine man hours. You count them, there's nine people here. And, and this gentleman here is probably smoking a cigarette. None were not working. Uh, nine man hours to turn this pile. OK, or five minutes using a, what I call, a small scale uh, windrow. Uh, equipment built by Frontier. You can go to Frontier Company, uh, their website. They sell all kind of equipment. Uh, this is uh, owned by Mr. Lynn Remzing. Actually, it's for sale. He's a he's a salesman. He's a grower. He's a salesman. Uh, I think he remember I uh, telling me it was like about seven thousand dollars for this, this equipment, um, and it's really nothing more than a I don't know, like a rototiller, above ground rototiller that will go over the pile and mixes it up. So the, the uh, height and width of the pile is determined by this width and by this height. OK, but uh, it will make your life easy. Uh, for a small scale operation, you can do a 50 foot long stretch and just the length that drives you to go, uh, just the length of time it takes you to drive slow with that tractor. Uh, but this video was a quick 10-second uh, clip of this machine in operation. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of dust uh, coming out of it. And don't confuse dust with steam. Uh, dust, I told him, why are you turning it? Uh, you're just playing with it. He said, I know, I know. Uh, this is just to show you the machine. Uh, if there's dust coming out of it, there's not enough moisture. If there's steam coming out of it, then you know it was cooking and you are releasing the excess heat from the inside uh, out. I apologize about the video. Uh, anyway, here is another uh, machine uh, uh, tow behind on the side. Um, Frontier industry, and here's some examples um, uh, like FTB 10. Uh, it needs a 50 horsepower tractor, can do 1,000 cubic yards per hour. So imagine 3 by 3 by 3 is 1 cubic yard. So imagine 3 by 3 times 1,000 long, foot long 
and it can do that in one hour. And uh, FTB, Scout FTB12 needs a bigger tractor, 75 horsepower, uh, and can do 1,400 cubic yard per hour. Cost of these equipment, again, anything between uh, five to $15,000. What is this here? Okay, well, um, um, remember we talked about adding water? You definitely need to add water. Does this look like just water to me? No, looks like there's some fertilizer in it. Is there a benefit of adding a little bit of nitrogen, extra nitrogen, to break down um, uh, high carbon? I mean, this looks like pure carbon source. Uh, and, uh, so remember what Molly said, you really need a nice ra ratio of carbon to nitrogen. This is 100% carbon or raw material. So like Molly said, it takes a long time to decompose. Uh, it will never heat up. Uh, the, the bacteria will never kick in. So this is the nitrogen source. Okay? Uh, not just water, nitrogen source. Actually, there are some companies that add enzymes, wood breaking enzymes. And some of those enzymes are proprietary. They don't tell me. It's like a secret. They don't tell me what is that secret enzyme, but uh, um, I don't think uh, uh, they're hard to find. You can buy your own, and basically the enzyme is a cellulase. It's an enzyme that breaks down the cellulose and the fiber and speed up the process. As a business, not as a homeowner, as a business, you want to factor in that cost. Uh, how much it cost me? How much am I selling? Is that extra cost making make uh, gonna make me profit or not? Will it work? Yes, it will work. But whether it make you profit or not is is uh, uh, what you're concerned. This is a beautiful picture. So imagine here. This is a cross section of your compost pile, and uh, and you can imagine it divided into three sections: zone one, zone two, and zone three. Zone 1 is what they call the dead zone, this uh, large-scale operation that uses a lot of the frontier uh, equipment. Uh, this is his notes. That's not to my knowledge. That's his experience. Uh, the gentleman says that Zone 1, he calls it the dead zone. Okay, no matter what you do or no matter what you think, even after uh, turning a day later, uh, this will get deprived of oxygen. Uh, because of the weight uh, on top of it, and it cooks faster, and it becomes dead zone quick. Okay, the green zone is the sweet spot of the composting. Okay, the ideal combination of temperature and moisture. Uh, uh, and zone three is no matter what you do, it will dry out quick. Uh, so. Uh, that is why uh, the, you need to turn it to bring this out and this in um, as fast as possible, as economically as possible to get the perfect product. You can turn it every day, uh, get it done faster, but it's not economical. Uh, you can turn it faster, finish faster, save money on labor, but it's not going to be a good product. So that is, like I said, there's not one cookbook recipe that I tell you every 24 hours turn it, every three days add five ounces of water. There's no cookbook recipe. Uh, you'll have to find the, the sweet spot that works for you, depending on the size, on the equipment that you use, on the raw material you start with, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it takes time. Uh, for a commercial operation uh, to fin to get a finished product, uh, you have to keep in mind that you need to mix, aerate, fluff the final product, and of course, at the end, sift it and bag it and sell it. Um, the more you can uh, mix, aerate, and fluff the compost per pass, the fewer passes you need. But uh, but then you cannot say then uh, then but turning it spinning that uh, 
mixer faster is not the answer, uh, going faster, driving the tractor faster is not the answer. It is all a balance. Um, and how do you find that balance? You turn it one time and you measure the temperature. You turn it uh, at a different speed the next time and you measure the temperature and uh, a, few, a day later and then you see, hey, uh, or it uh, finished a few days earlier. It is basically learning how to do it for your operation. And But once you find the cookbook recipe that works for you, for the equipment that you're using, for the size of equipment that you're using, for the amount of water that you're adding, for the mixture that you're starting with, whether adding fertilizer, whether adding bone meal or blood meal, um, once you find that, then life is easy. You're just worrying that you just worry about selling, marketing, bagging, sifting. Uh, the managerial aspect of your business rather than the production aspect of your business. And I like this question here, how good is the material? You can finish it in three weeks, but it uh, looks uh, finished, but it's really 50% finished. And then you sell it. If, if you don't have repeat customer, uh, you're losing money in the long run. You can sell a lot one time, but if there's no repeat customer, um, people will quickly find out that next year that product wasn't good. I'm not buying it. I'm going somewhere else. Okay, so I showed you the um, Frontier equipment that cost about a th seven to ten thousand uh, dollars. Large scale operation uh, do exist, um, and New Earth compost. Okay, uh, uh, New Earth Company in San Antonio. Your voice is okay. Your voice is okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Your voice. Okay. Um, and I will turn. Uh, I will uh, uh, turn it to over to Molly to share uh, the picture she got uh, from her contact with New Earth in San Antonio. <laughs> Okay, when I took the, um, at the compost specialist course in San Antonio, one of the true highlights of that course was being able to take a tour of the New Earth Incorporated facility. And I want to share a few of the pictures that are in their, their operation. And again, you're going to see that the same exact um, procedures apply. It's just in a much, much bigger scale. Okay, New Earth is located, they have two locations now. One of them is in San Antonio on I-10. If you're familiar with San Antonio I-10, it's right off of Foster Road. And it's also located now in Conroe on Highway 105 East. This began at L&H Packing Company in San Antonio about 15 years ago. They, this particular operation had a terrific problem with manure recycling. and the procedures developed to handle that problem uh, resulted in the creation of New Earth as being a company. And since then, it's expanded tr tremendously. They specialize in manufacturing compost, soils, mulch. They also recycle brush, organics, and biosolids. But I'm only going to talk about compost. So biosolids and, uh, and single ground mulch are dumped to form windrows. But when you were talking about that little five-foot <laughs> high windrow, these little babies, let me go back and get my highlighter. This is 300 feet long by 11 feet high by 21 feet wide. And what you see coming off of that pile is not, uh, is not dust. That is steam. This is a working pile. Now, remember that little machine that he showed you the fo that Foster made? Well, as you know, all compost needs to be turned to, pro to promote air circulation. But what do you do when you've got a, a windrow, again, and I would love to know where that term came from, um, that's 300 feet long and that high? Well, there's a company in Germany called Bacchus, and they make a windrow turner. And this little baby right here costs $500,000. It's built to straddle the height of that windrow. 
and to turn the center of the pile to the outside and the outside to the center. And look at, whoops, right here. These are the blades. Look at that in the proportion of a fully grown man. Huge. Here's a close-up of what the blades look like. Note the design, and you'll see right in here going out to the side and this going down to the front, so everything is turned. Let's see, there we go. Now this is the windrow being turned. It shows the debacus from the side, and you'll notice that it's straddling the windrow, and once again, this is not, this is not dust, that's steam being released from the center of the pile. So when they build a new windrow, they uh, spray it with a coenzyme, which of course it didn't tell me what it was, and it's turned twice with the bacchus to thoroughly mix it up. The windrow sit for one, or, one to two months, and they want to get the temperature, the, check, the temperatures checked twice a week. You notice this is a, a master gardener on the tour, and she is checking the, uh, the temperature with the digital thermometer. Anyway, so it's turned five or six times before, it's being, before they consider it to be done. Then it's transferred to curing piles before being, once again, screened and bagged. This is taking the uh, finished compost and dumping that into a truck that's going to take it to the bagging facility. Now, when I was told my contact at New Earth that I was going to be doing this presentation, I sent him a copy of uh, my PowerPoint, and he very quickly said, you were here two years ago. This operation here was hand done, manually done, whatever you want to say. And this is what it, in 2000, if you see the, the picture on the right, this is, it's, the, the operation is now totally automated. And the machine there on the left is the one that actually, you can see at the top, this is the hopper with the, um, the compost, you know, coming down. And then it is automatically put into bags. It's sent up a conveyor belt, which seals the bags. Well. You see that long sheets that will cut the sheet and form the bag, seal it, fill it, and close it. Right. So it's like a long roll that becomes a bag. So this forms the bag, fills it, and seal it. And this is the finished uh, the finished product. Now in college, the, and as you, you noticed before, remember cubic feet. Here we go. One cubic feet. One cubic foot. And this particular product is the bedding mix and somebody left their water bottle. Water. <laughs> anyway, I was delighted to find out that New Earth is, is, uh, is available in College Station. But look for it, because it's a real, it's a quality, quality product. So, in summary, now one thing, as a Master Gardener, um, I'm continually learning. And originally that I was taught that the compost pile needed light. Well, actually, it's not really light, it's heat. So this is where, you know, obviously that if, you, if, you're, if you've got a compost pile going in the winter, it's going to take a lot longer than it would in the summer, not, be, not because really of the light, it's because of the heat. But in summary, no matter how small or how large your composting operation is, the steps still remain the same. Gather materials into a manageable pile. Turn the pile regularly to make sure that you get a proper oxygen mix. Make sure that the pile gets enough moisture. Measure the temperature regularly to make sure it's cooking. And screen the compost before using. Okay, I really, I'd have to ask my, the question here is, are the plastic from the bags gained from recycled plastic? Um, I'd have to get a hold of my contact at New Earth to find out that question, but I wouldn't really be surprised because they are so heavily into recycling. Um, you know, they have a, a, a giant, what they call uh, a static green pile that, they, that, that comes from, from, uh, from, you know, all green material, vegetables, whatever. I have a picture of one of the piles that's got a watermelon out in front of it. 
So as deeply as they are into, into recycling, I'm sure it probably does come from recycling materials, but uh, I will check on it. All right. The pictures that you saw uh, for the small and large acreage is what we call active composting. And, and active meaning you're adding energy uh, in the form of turning it uh, to, uh, to, make it fa to make it faster, uh, done faster. Uh, passive uh, composting, uh, uh, sorry, active composting can also be done, uh, and, and I could not find any pictures, I thought I did, where they cover the whole windrow even as long as what you see here, they cover it with a heavy tarp and they put in hot steam. And the combination of hot steam and then air and then hot steam and air, maybe that's what they call passive, uh, where there's no mechanical turning, but the steam and air makes it compost and it's covered to seal the steam. Uh, but it's not very popular because it is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very tricky on what, how much steam, how often, how much air, how often to get that perfect compost pile. All right, let me start answering some questions. There was a question earlier, defoliants and cottonseed trash, any issues? Uh, most defoliants have a short residual, uh, paraquat, uh, most defoliants uh, don't have long residual issues. If you look at all the list of herbicides or pesticides, uh, there's only few families that have long residual issues. The picloramps, the uh, aminopyrrolids, uh, 2,4-D is, has some, but not as bad. Roundup has some, but not as bad. Uh, so, um, I guess uh, I, I'm not an expert on defoliants. If uh, you read the label and it tells you, you know, hey, do not plant a crop after you use a defoliant for 18 months, then I, even if it doesn't tell you it uh, has soil residue, uh, then I would think that that's a clue that uh, it has long residual issue. Of course, it's going into the compost pile at the heat. Uh, most uh, so far, I only know of aminopyrrolid and uh, picloram that have an issue. So it's not a full answer; it's just getting you started on the right track. Retail available compost additives. Compost additives. Uh, uh, there's a question on what's uh, retail available compost additives. If you mean uh, vermiculite um, uh, as an additive uh, to the compost, because when you buy a potting mix, it's really a compost and then some vermiculite and some fertilizer. Yes, you can buy vermiculite by the yardful. Uh, and commercial uh, greenhouse operators, they do buy it uh, and then mix it in with their potting mix uh, when they, uh, when they uh, fill in the nursery pots. If that's what you mean by vermiculite. If not, please specify. Uh, can you discuss anything about compost attracting crazy ants? Uh, compost, if it is not done right, I call it a trash pile. Mm -hmm. And when it is a trash pile, you will have crazy ants, you will have mice, you will have all kind of things. If it is too hot and you're turning it often, it will not be a hospitable environment for crazy ants. So if you have a, a trash pile, you have a problem. If you have a compost pile, you should not have a problem. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Microbes, enzymes, or just nitrogen? Uh, now, it's funny that uh, you, you mentioned that. Uh, I know homeowners, and I know small size operations that leave a little bit of the previous compost pile as a starter uh, for the next compost pile. 
okay kind of like yeast taking a little bit of yogurt uh, to make more yogurt as a yeast starter uh, same idea uh, microbes uh, because that compost has the enzymes has the microbes has the life in it uh, to to start composting the new pile that you added that's when you take the materials left over from sifting and put it into that pile that you're that's, working on that's uh, that's it, it, it kind of gets them started exactly and enzymes, uh, there is a uh, product called, and I've seen it at Producers Co-op, called uh, Compost Starter. And I bet you it's a combination of microbes and enzymes. I haven't read the label. I've never used it. Um, that uh, that I think of it as yeast. You add yeast and water and warm it up, and you add it to flour to start the fermentation process. Same idea with that compost starter. Um, nitrogen, if you think your pile is not breaking down too fast, you have a lot of brown material, then adding a little bit of fertilizer, uh, blood, uh, meal. Uh, blood meal as a great source of, uh, uh, good source of uh, f uh, nitrogen, not an excessive amount. You can't go wrong by adding excessive amount if you use blood meal. That will help uh, speed up the, uh, the process. Can you discuss the average pH of finished compost? Okay, uh, I have tested uh, mushroom compost multiple times, and it, it ranged between 6.8 to 6.9. Um, ideal. Uh, uh, so I've never seen any pH uh, too high or too low. So uh, don't worry about the pH of the compost. Don't worry if you buy a potting mix. Do you measure its pH? It is ideal soil. What does it do to the soil? Not only, like Molly mentioned, it improves the drainage in clay soil and improves water retention in sandy soil, but P, uh, compost acts as a buffer to the soil pH. If you have compost, like that gentleman who has a foot and a half deep uh, of uh, in his garden of compost, his soil pH is one point. Uh, sorry, is six point eight. His water pH is eight, and his uh, soil pH uh, remains six point eight year after year because that soil, that compost acts as a buffer. It does not allow the soil pH to change dramatically or fast. Um, by adding uh, water that's uh, higher pH. So uh, remember Bill Adams' statement, the gardener with the most compost wins. That is why, because pH, drainage, nutrition, life, uh, uh, you know, microorganism type life that's uh, breaking down the material for you to make it available uh, for the plant roots. Compost accelerator products on the market. To Go ahead. Um, when I build my comp a new compost pile, I live in a, a, a log house, as I said before, that's basically surrounded by a post oak forest. So I got lots and lots and lots of carbon, but not a whole lot of nitrogen. So um, I get whatever nitrogen I can, especially you know from my uh, from my my vegetable scraps and all that and whatever plant debris I have. Okay, would alfalfa hay be a good gift? Probably so. For um, Anyway, going back to the accelerator, what I add is maybe uh, I get um, blood meal, organic blood meal, add about maybe half a bag of that, and I also have some, uh, that's, you know, for the, for the nitrogen kicker, because I don't have a whole lot of nitrogen. And I also add, um, I have molasses, that is in a granulated form. And I throw in a few cups of that, and that's to get the, um, the microbes and stuff, give them something to eat right off the bat. And you're thinking molasses and stuff, would that attract nasty critters like the ants? Never has. What would you think about the alfalfa? Alfalfa, um, high nitrogen. Yeah, I mean, yes, alfalfa. I mean, if you have the right mixture of green and brown matter, you don't have to add a compost starter. 
So if that's what you have, why, why not? Uh, I think people get impatient, and if they've never done composting before, they want to make sure they get, I mean, we want the instant fix, right? We want yes. instant results. Yes, yes. And with composting, um, I mean, I think my biggest question when I, when I was first doing it was, so when do you know when it's done? And, well, what it comes down to is, of course, uh, you turn it, you know, every couple of weeks, uh, more so if you want a bacterial soil. And you at least put your hand in there to make sure that it's hot, you know, that this is still going. If it goes down, then you want to add uh, some more nitrogen. If it starts to stink, then you turn it and you add more carbon. And uh, it's, 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 it all comes down to experience, and especially once you've done it right. And as I said, you know, when I, when I sifted my last batch of compost and I had five earthworms in it, I said, hot diggity dog, now I'm on my way. When it looks like a bag of potting mix, when it smells like it, well, don't smell it if you don't want uh, too much, uh, too, don't smell it too much if you don't want bronchitis. Um, but when it looks ready and it feels ready, it does not have to be 100% uh, ready because you sift it and you use it and you continue processing the rest. But uh, with experience, you learn that, hey, a couple of months and it's done in June. But if I start a compost pile in October, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get it in April the following year. Uh, with experience, you'll learn that. But uh, don't be impatient, but it needs work. It's not a trash pile. Uh, most of the people, the gardeners that I see, they have a trash pile, not a compost pile. What's really neat is when you you um, you take some plants and you add your com you you know you plant with your compost, and then you have another black batch of plants and you use something commercially, and yours are doing better. That gives you such a kick. And one more comment here: when you look at this windrow. This is uh, started at, at one time. So they filled the 20 by 11 by 300 foot long at one time. So same thing I tell my homeowner on, or even the small acreage growers. I tell them your compost pile have to start at one time. If you uh, try to get, uh, even if you have one bin, three by three by three, uh, you want to be successful? Make sure that bin uh, is filled up at once instead of every day one banana peel, a little bit of coffee, a little bit of lettuce leaves. Uh, that is a trash pile. If you want to be good at it and if you want to be, uh, if you are impatient or you want to do a good job, forget impatient, if you want to do a good job, fill uh, that compost bin at once then it will be done at once with maybe 90, 95% done, a little bit of some matter that you sift and you recycle, you put back, uh, just like the commercial operations do that you see here. They fill that row at once and start the process, not a little bit at a time as, as they get the material ready. That is um, the biggest, uh, me, the biggest key to success uh, for at, at any size of operation you, you're thinking about. Any other questions? Well, if there's no more, okay, two more people. Wood ash. Wood ash, uh, you mean uh, you burned wood and you have ash. Wood ash is uh, like Molly said, be careful. My opinion of it is a great source of phosphorus uh, or potassium, uh, but it's a very, very high pH, very high pH. So you want to spread a sprinkle here and there in your garden. Uh, it's a great source of potassium or phosphorus. I forget. Uh, I know one of those two. Great source. I think it's phosphorus, which we have too much anyway, right? Uh, phosphorus, which we already have too much anyway. And if you want to, if you, potassium, okay, if you, um, if you ever had a wood uh, pile burned, uh, watch how long it took, how long it took f for anything to grow where that uh, uh, burning pile was. So uh, try not to use it. 
uh, if you have a lot of wood ash, I would say spread it in your uh, in your, in your uh, wooded lot. If you have, uh, it's better let it go back to nature. Uh, use it very in very thin amounts because uh, uh, you don't want to increase your pH. What would be the ratio of coffee grinds to the compost pile? Um, coffee grinds are a great source of nitrogen. Um, so you kind of have to play with it. it. It depends on how much carbon that you're throwing in there. But it, it, it is wonderful. It's, 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 um, it's superb in, in, the, um, in your compost pile. The main, the main thing you're talking about, again, is that ratio. So, you don't want to have just, just, just you know, 100% coffee grounds. You've got to mix some other stuff in there with it. So remember in one of the slides, Molly mentioned that uh, one-third uh, green and two-thirds brown. So maybe that's a starting point to say if I have plenty of coffee grinds, uh, that's one-third and then the rest uh, brown material, dry leaves, etc., etc. It can't kill. Uh, will it kill uh, in concentration? It won't because uh, when it breaks down, it's a it's compost. It, will it kill citrus if it's applied before composting? That is not a question for me. I, I am not sure. I doubt it will. Um, from my personal experience, we I pour all the extra coffee uh, on my plants that, yeah. I, that I have at home tomatoes, you put them around tomatoes. and uh, it's not uh, I mean it's not super acidic or super uh, uh, basic that it's gonna kill anything so it's a uh, carbon no coffee grinds is a source of nitrogen so that's why we said uh, if you have access to a lot of coffee grinds, you're lucky to go to Starbucks and they can get, get give you all the coffee uh, that they finished with. Uh, use it uh, uh, the equivalent of the one third in your pile and two third of the brown material. If you also, like in my case, have a sh real shortage of of, of um, grass clippings. Uh, then the coffee grounds really come into you know in, into play as being a substitute for that. Yes. So coffee grinds are substitute for grass clipping, not uh, added in a, on top of the grass clippings, because then you'll have too much nitrogen. Okay. What happens if you have too much nitrogen? Just like Molly showed in one of her slides, it will cook faster. It will heat faster. So uh, you may you may get a compost pile done faster, but um, that means watching it every day or turning it every other day, and uh, and even then there's a risk of uh, overheating and spoiling too fast. And by spoiling, I mean it cooks itself too fast, and it and it's not a compost. It's uh, Cooking the Thanksgiving turkey in windrows. <laughs> or, <think> it's that high. <laughs> well, uh, uh, five years ago when I came to uh, Texas A&M, I attended a presentation by a gentleman who has a compost company. I forgot his name. Uh, Joe Novak invited him. And he said if he puts a cow, a dead cow, in his compost pile, and I'm sure he's talking about uh, a machine or a windrow like you see in this picture here. Uh, at the end of the two-month operation, all he's left is with the, is with the uh, plastic ear tag. Uh, Malcolm Beck. Well, oh, he's talking about cooking it, not shredding it. Cooking the Thanksgiving turkey in windrows? Oh, you mean is it hot enough yes, to cook yes. the Thanksgiving yes. turkey? <laughs> okay, uh, that's uh, Malcolm Beck. Uh, if he says so, uh, we'll have to try it. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. Um, well, hey, if you have 160 degrees and you're willing and you wrap it and you put it and it stays there for two or three days, I guess that's slow cooking. I mean, that's the idea of uh, the, uh, um, you know, you, slow the slow cooker or you put a pit 
Um, what is that uh, cow head famous in in South Texas? Uh, you know, you put charcoal and oh, you, yeah, the pit, yeah. you put a pit and you put hot charcoal and barbacoa. Thank you, Boone. And I mean, that's the same idea. If you have the same temperature and you leave it overnight, 12 hours, I, I'm not, I will believe it. I mean, I will believe that it can, it can be done. I mean, it sounds reasonable. I have, sounds uh, reasonable. Yes. If your temperature inside is at 160 or higher, because you don't want it to spoil faster than it's uh, cooking. Sounds like a great Master Gardener project, Boone. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to email.